episodes in American history command greater disparity in interpretation than Reconstruction. Since before the event te technically ended with the Great Compromise of 1877, which traded a Republican president for the removal of Northern military occupation, historians, politicians, and would-be pundits presented in startling detail the few things everyone agreed upon. Blatant corruption, graft, waste, and violence. Where they disagreed from the start, even to today, or the origins of these terrible conditions, and perhaps most important, the means by which black and white Southerners survived the foreboding period. Jeffrey Hummel, in his economic study of the war and reconstruction, entitled Emancipating Slaves, Enslaving Free Men, notes the cost of the great event. Quoting Lincoln's Attorney General, Edward Bates, Hummel repeats, quote, the demoralizing effect of this civil war is plainly visible in every department of life. The abuse of official powers and the thirst for dishonest gain are now so common they cease to shock. Among such examples are the South Carolina legislature funding $1,000 to extinguish a gambling debt of its speaker. Congress voting itself a pay raise in 1873, only to have a subsequent Congress repeal it after public outrage. And countless examples of fraud, neglect, bribery, and every manner of corruption as Southern legislatures raced to see who could waste the most money building railroads. The suffering of the war, compounded with the burdens of Reconstruction government spending, nearly broke the backs of all Southerners. On average, state taxes tripled, tripled, and in some places quadrupled from their rates in 1860. And given that most of these involve property taxes, diminishing land prices exasperated their weight. So much was the tax burden in Mississippi that some estimate up to 15% of all sellable property went up for auction. And this in a state where the largest single budget line item was the purchasing and distribution of artificial limbs for Confederate veterans. Literacy rates of white Southerners, once one of the highest in the known world in the 1850s, precipitously fell with the collapse of its education system. Federal insistence that southern states build public grade schools did nothing to improve those declines. For blacks, the effects of public education showed no substantial gains by the mid-1870s as freedmen literacy rates only marginally increased despite the yearnings of former slaves to read and write. In other words, uh, even slaves were not educated uh, in, in such a way that, that they deserve. For the formerly enslaved, freedom gave them the ability to move, marry, own property, testify in court, and vote as free people of color. Yet carpetbag governments run by northerners placed severe limitations on how those new freedoms could be exercised. While not nearly as stringent as the black codes passed by returning Confederates, carpetbag regimes did little to give blacks the life and liberty they desperately wanted. For African slaves, the only example of freedom most saw for generations was that of their white masters in the South. And I'll mention this again in, in a moment. 
Uh, and true enough, it is the case that some free blacks before the war in key sectors of the economy did provide some light uh, services and could have been an example, but were primarily not because these remain largely confined to major cities like New Orleans and Richmond or border towns like Baltimore. The vast majority of slaves only saw the freedom enjoyed by Southern whites. This meant that when freedom finally came, blacks immediately hit the road in search of family members previously sold or otherwise dispersed by the war. In the wake of the sheer destruction left by Union armies and retreating Confederates, combined with slaves looking for family members, and which was in fact a loss of a huge part of the South's labor, the plantation and small farm economy of the South collapsed. Immediately, poverty ensued, as did crop failures, famines, disease, and starvation that affected whites and blacks alike. Infant mortality skyrocketed, though pegging an actual figure is difficult. Equally difficult is determining how many former slaves died as a result of the war and Reconstruction. Some estimate as many as 20% of the southern black population in key areas may have died as a result of the war and the following economic collapse. Abolitionists never raise monuments for those inadvertently killed for their freedom. In light of the corruption, political pressure, high taxes, starvation, and sheer humiliation of seeing their world turned upside down, white Southerners lashed out against each other and against the former slaves. Murders, rapes, arson, and crimes of every manner became rampant, though we may never know exactly to what extent. So thorough was the corruption of Reconstruction governments that Southern Unionists, those who opposed secession and opposed the war, eventually started voting for redemption at the hands of former Confederates. Edmund Drago, in his important study, Hooray for Hampton, Black Red Shirts, notes conclusive evidence that even freedmen worked and voted for Redeemer governments. Few things, however, reflected the radicalism of Reconstruction more than the treatment of African American women. Physical intimidation and violation notwithstanding, black Southern women faced a cruel judgment. Again, given that blacks only knew the freedom enjoyed by their masters, when emancipation came, those families remaining together quickly mimicked the structure and life of white Southern families. Men tried to farm the ground. Women now remained in the home to raise their children and tend to the house. At long last, Southern black couples could legally marry, enjoy leisure, and complement each other in the tending of their farms and raising of their children. This was their ideal of freedom, ladies and gentlemen. Not voting, not moving, not holding public office, but being an American family, being a Southern family. But when cotton production failed to meet the demands of Northern textile mills, Black women were sent to the fields again to toil side by side with their husbands. Legally married, their daily lives seemed to have changed little. The costs of the war and Reconstruction were astronomical. With over 10,000 military engagements, nearly one million men are now thought killed and nearly as many were wounded or dead from the destruction of the war. Having cost the United States over $5 billion, 
billion. dollars. That's in 1860 terms. Let's say it again. Five billion dollars. The national debt alone rose from 65 million dollars in 1860 to over two and a half billion dollars by the war's end. No doubt, the heaviest financial cost of the war was the uncompensated emancipation of an additional four billion dollars in Southern slaves. Say it again: four billion dollars. A confiscation of wealth only rivaled in human history by the Bolshevik Revolution. Totaling the cost, Americans could have purchased the emancipation of all slaves and bought each family a small farm, tools, and livestock, and still had money left over. For all Americans, on average, all Americans. It is unlikely they recover the same standard of living they enjoyed in 1860 until at least 1870. Uh, they lost an entire decade, and for Southerners, it took nearly a century to regain parity with the average income of other Americans. The cost of war and Reconstruction, along with their violent and cruel images of hatred and division, are perhaps only the most visible reminders. There were other consequences, some of which continue to impact American life and identity today. As noted, few episodes in American life were ever interpreted in such widely varying ways. Perhaps the same could be said for the New South, from 1877 to until the beginning of the 20th century. Especially if we treat the New South as sort of a, an extension of the Reconstruction South. There remain several key elements of this story that deserve further attention, as they are often repeated inaccurately by scholars and journalists alike. For the purposes here, two, two of these myths are going to be discussed further. Two things. Two. I think resolving the first myth of Reconstruction and the New South. May clarify much of what we question about Southern politics for the century after the war. This first myth revolves around the constituency of the Southern Democratic Party and portrayal of that party as a continuation of the antebellum Jeffersonian tradition. It's how it's normally treated. The Democrats after the war were the same Democrats before the war. After the war, it's all states' rights、uh, Jeffersonians, just like before the war, it was states' rights Jeffersonians. All too often, we are reminded that secession and states' rights, white supremacy and segregation, were always the heart of the 19th century Democratic Party. That Southern Democrats, as a party, simply extended after the war slavery by other means. There is little proof that the Democratic Party, ladies and gentlemen, remained the same. An examination of the postbellum Democratic Party has to begin with the antebellum Whigs,、uh, who were these were this was the other major political party in the United States before the war. And they were basically the people best known for their centralizing and Hamiltonian tendencies. The Whig Party was the party of those who wished to speed up economic progress. They equated genuine human progress with things you could see: businesses, roads, trains, factories, banks, government debt, and other kinds of economic institutions. The Whigs faced a series of problems in antebe the antebellum period. First, the first problem they faced: they championed Congress and the process of congressional or parliamentary politics. This is why they chose the name Whigs. It's W-H-I-G-S. It's not Whigs you wear in your hair.、Um, they chose the name Whigs because they took the name of the 18th century British champions of Parliament, who also called themselves Whigs. As opposed to calling themselves Tories or the defenders of the monarchy, 
And like the British Whigs, American Whigs experienced a great many problems running Congress and packaging together intellectuals, uh, excuse me, legislation. In effect, both the British Whig Party and the American Whig Party it sort of collapsed for the same reason. They love parliamentary politics, but they weren't very good at it. <clears throat> the fact is, the Whigs were not good at political negotiation. Irrespective of the mantle of their great leader, Henry Clay, who was known as the Great Compromiser, putting together a legislative coalition that rewarded enough economic interest, required sophisticated party organization, tight control over backbenchers and junior members, and long term sustainable financial strategies. The Whigs didn't really have these things. Second reason they failed. They failed not only to keep up their party organization and keep it together, they failed to appreciate the unintended consequences of their financial policies. They did not understand monetary policy, trade policy, and the emergence of modern business cycles. They did not realize that at the local, state, and national level, the financial order they created, built as it was on fractional reserve lending in banks, tariffs, government debt, and inflationary monetary policy could not be sustained. Imagine that. They often confused entrepreneurs and business owners, and these things led to significant financial booms, temporary financial booms, but were followed by steep financial busts. And each time these busts occurred, it usually plagued the electoral success and opportunities for the Whigs. So everybody loved this idea. Sure, they're going to make the economy grow. Wonderful. Let's pass all of this Whig legislation. And then when the economy tanked following the initial boom, the Whigs were to blame. Uh, antebellum Americans understood this. In fact, they understood economics a lot better than Americans today. Uh, and they knew who to blame. Third, the third reason. The Whig coalition included not only economic nationalists, the Hamiltonians, as in Alexander Hamilton, but also significant fragments of the American virtue tradition or the political descendants of John Adams. Now, seldom, we, we've heard of the Jeffersonians, right? right, right. Heard of the Hamiltonians, right? but no one's ever heard of the Adamsian tradition, right? It's because it's too hard to pronounce. Um, uh, we might want to call it sort of a moral nationalist uh, vision as opposed to an economic nationalist vision, a moral centralizing position if you want to. I call it the virtue tradition. It just depends on what mood I'm in. For this segment of the Whig Party, all political decisions depended upon principle, not negotiation. Further, the virtue side, or as I said, the moral nationalist side, defined con uh, progress, defined social progress as social reform. Less drinking, less prostitution, less mental illness, less crime, and of course, less slavery. Including these people in party operations complicated their negotiations with Democrats and also impaired coalition building across American regions. So the Whig Party remained an uneasy alliance of people with little in common except reducing constitutional limits on the national government. And by the late 1840s, the Whig Party had collapsed. And while Northern Whigs naturally migrated to the new anti-slavery party, the Republican Party, Southern Whigs had no place to go. They had little choice but to merge with Democrats, where they bided their time and hoped for political opportunities. Now, things will start getting confusing here. So, 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 so um, if, I, if I go too fast, wave your hand at me. It should be that known that Southern Whigs, uh, now Democrats, had little on which they could campaign. 
You see, ladies and gentlemen, by the late 1840s, Jeffersonian Democrats held the hearts and minds of most Southern voters, helped in part by serious financial crises in Southern state governments, all caused by Whig, old Whig um, 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 legislation and deals. So in response to several state governments going bankrupt, Southern Southerners amended their state constitutions, which prevented typical Whig measures from being implemented. In many places, government debt was outlawed. In places like Arkansas, they just outlawed banks altogether. So the Whigs were constitutionally prevented from implementing all the things they had campaigned on and tried to do for the previous 40 years or so. They simply had nothing on which to campaign. And thus they did exactly what Northern Whigs did, like Abraham Lincoln. They made slavery their campaign issue. But in the South, it was pro-slavery, not anti-slavery. Old Southern Whigs thus campaigned on an extreme pro-slavery position, combined with equally extreme commitments to white supremacy. Now, this is not to say that Jeffersonian Democrats never used these issues, but it is to say that old Whigs unintentionally radicalized key segments of Southern politics and set the stage for a dangerous racial environment that had disastrous consequences after the war. The best example of this is Alex Alexander Hamilton Stevens, Alexander Hamilton Stevens' famous cornerstone speech, in which he argued slavery was the cornerstone of the Confederacy. Now, despite Stevens' later um, uh, insisting that newspapers misquoted him, his commitment to white supremacy was typical of old Whig, now Democrat, Southern politicians, who otherwise would never have been elected on their regular platform. I mean, what were they going to do? I believe in high tariffs, vote for me. Let's have more government debt and more government spending. No. So they did exactly the same thing that Northern Whigs did, but, but the, just in the reverse kind of strategy. So what develops is a white, among these uh, old Southern Whigs, now Democrats, is a white financial elite with a skewed understanding of middling class whites and all blacks, who they believe, these other whites and blacks, acted only on considerations of race. Does this sound familiar? These politicians fed this and used it as a political tool to manipulate voters. Now, making matters worse, Democrats, the other Democrats, the Jeffersonian Democrats, they made critical strategic mistakes in their efforts to present a united political front during the war. During its course, Jefferson Davis, the son-in-law of Whig President Zachary Taylor, for, for three months before his wife passed away, he was son-in-law of a Whig president, um, Democrat Jefferson Davis appointed old Whigs to key policy-making positions in which they implemented an angry version of old Whig financial policies which wrecked the Southern economy. This is why we have the highest inflation rates in uh, North American history. But these old Whigs, now Democrats, pulled off one of the single most important and far-reaching political maneuvers in all of American history. As the war dragged on and Southerners suffered military defeat and financial disasters, these old Whigs successfully blamed the Jeffersonian Democrats for all of these problems. Such that by the last Confederate election, 
The stage was set for old Whigs to now gain control and eventually dominate Southern politics within a generation. Yes, some old Jeffersonians remained and bravely resisted the worst aspects of this old Whig agenda. Perhaps Wade Hampton in South Carolina is the best example. But ladies and gentlemen, it was the old Whigs in the South, like Stevens, newly elected governor to, in Georgia, and LQC Lamar, Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus Lamar in Mississippi, who held the upper hand. They first called themselves conservatives during Reconstruction, then once, then once again borrowed a European term. They called themselves Bourbons, then came to be known as Redeemers. In the end, they were Democrats and would remain so for the next 100 years. And they also had learned valuable lessons from the necessities of Reconstruction. They learned how to negotiate. They learned how to cut deals, finally. They learned to work within the New World. A post-bellum politics were trade-offs, omnibus legislative bills, and nationalist agenda benefited um, uh, from the national decline in Jeffersonian politicians, especially the last of the hard-money Democrats like President Grover Cleveland. Another benefit that these uh, old Whig New Democrats had, they had very few social reformers in their party to deal with. Those that did exist in the South rarely engaged in politics. And nationally, social reform remained the purview of the Republican Party and then eventually the Progressive Party. So uh, within this whole virtue tradition, I'm sorry, without that virtue tradition, the Ad John Adams side of American political culture, and without Jeffersonians to contend with, because they had demonized them, the Hamiltonian, old Whig, conservative, bourbon, redeemer, Democrats, faced little organized opposition except during the populist movement of the 1890s. Ladies and gentlemen, the long-term political significance of this cannot be underestimated. Of course, there were exceptions. But in general, these old Whigs dominated the Southern Democratic Party and ousted serious Jeffersonian politicians from party influence. They did pay lip service to Jeffersonian principles, but rarely committed to them. After all, it's easy to use a Jeffersonian language of balanced budget and conservative financial restraint when you have no money. What are they going to do? It meant then that Jeffersonian Southerners, despite maintaining the political franchise, seldom won office and influenced Southern politics even less often. Jeffersonianism ceased being a political force throughout the South. Jeffersonian politics retreated and did so not only in the South, but throughout the United States. This set the stage for a transformation of, the, of American politics. To wit, Hamiltonians competed with their Adams adversaries, adversaries and Jeffersonians mounted at best rear guard efforts at the margins. It's Hamiltonians versus the Adams guys. Ladies and gentlemen, this was 20th century America. This was Lincoln's America. A second myth about the Reconstruction and New South era involves the North. Northerners faced their own series of political and intellectual problems. The most important was a crisis in national identity that shaped how Americans understood themselves and affected major constitutional issues. This has already been raised in a previous discussion earlier today. The heart of this crisis involved the fabrication of what Brian McClanahan wisely calls the myth of a righteous cause. 
And Brian deserves credit for that. I love that myth of the righteous cause. I think he also calls it the righteous cause one as opposed to the lost cause. It's the what righteous cause one. Now, this myth evolved through a series of histories, political speeches, and notable public events, the most important of which was the funeral of Abraham Lincoln. During that ceremony, the interior of the Illinois State House was draped in signs that read, quote, Washington, our father, Lincoln, our savior. Uh, the, uh, the, the Abraham Lincoln Museum in Springfield has a reconstruction of this, by the way. Actually, the portion of the State House is reconstruction, re reconstructed, and it shows the banners for all to see. <clears throat> Beyond Lincoln's messianic role, the Northern Righteous Cause rested on several important assumptions, and I'm going to talk about three of them. These are the three elements of the Righteous Cause one. Three. Number one. The failure of Reconstruction depended entirely on the recalcitrance of Southern whites. It's their fault. They caused the war. They're the reason Reconstruction failed. Number two, the Constitution survived unscathed. Third, and finally, the North won on every point, militarily, financially, constitutionally, religiously, and above all, culturally. I'm going to take each of these three in order. The first of these three points, I think, is easily refuted, but the latter two deserves significant explanation. To the first point, to argue that Reconstruction failed because it did not, because white Southerners did not allow it to go far enough. That not enough was done to pacify Southern white resistance and reward freedom with confiscated property is like arguing that William Shakespeare did not write his own plays. It is a sure sign of insanity. <laughs> Americans of the period were not so stupid. They saw the corruption, and as it became increasingly clear that some radical Republicans wished to bring to the North some of these policies and experiments implemented in the South, Northern voters quickly shifted their allegiance. Most Americans likely understood that charges of Southern violence may have been exaggerated, as they had already witnessed such exaggerations related to border conflicts in the 1850s, like the uh, term bleeding Kansas. There is still much that is unknown about violence in this period. Its extent, who was to blame, and the degree to which it was widely endorsed in light of so much corruption. Nonetheless, Americans of all stripes were fed up. They grew tired of the corruption of the Grant administration, the continual tweaks to the Constitution, everyday stories of another politician being bought by railroads, bankruptcies of government projects, lawlessness in the South and in the West, and radical reformers incapable of producing results. By 1874, the United States House of Representatives shifted to, the Dem to democratic control in one of the most sweeping victories in congressional electoral history. Three years later, Following one of the worst presidential elections, and amidst calls by, get this, Northern Democrats and Northern Republicans for another civil war, this time in the North, a compromise was reached that ended Reconstruction. There are many stories still to be told about the disillusionment that sank in among Northerners, 
countless tales of broken families, lost opportunities, suffering, and questions of faith, these are yet to be collected and interpreted for modern audiences. They are glossed over by the whirl of Western expansion, the unwashed masses entering Eastern ports, and the hustle and bustle of industrializing American cities and towns. But those stories are there. And are, they are reflected, I think, in the political, um, um, decisive political defections from the Republican Party. That saw Grover Cleveland, the last Jeffersonian president, elected, then re-elected to the highest office of the land. The disillusionment of Northerners, indeed of all Americans, with the semblance of constitutional order resulted in a hurried attempt by some intellectuals to defend the old regime and to insist on what I call the second plank of this righteous cause one argument, insist that the Constitution survived the war in its original pristine glory. Writing in the history of the Civil War, James Ford Rhodes admitted that no history of the war would be complete without mention of apparent violations of the Constitution. While he was a copperhead during the war, Rhodes, uh, Rhodes lamented uh, that, quote, for although he acted at times without warrant of the Constitution, being Lincoln, he had at the same time a profound reverence for it, showing in all his procedure that he much preferred to keep within the strict limits of the letter and the spirit of the organic law of the land, and whenever he exercised or permitted others to exercise arbitrary power, he did so with keen regret. George Tickner Curtis summarized this position as well. Curtis, by the way, is the man who defended Dred Scott before the U.S. Supreme Court. Summarized this position in his Constitutional History of the United States. He, limit, he lamented that while he wrote a similar history prior to the war, he was humbled as it progressed to see the Constitution remain. He wrote, quote, After the war was ended by a triumph of federal arms, Many more years elapsed before I could feel that the Constitution had come out of this turmoil with its principles in a fair state of preservation. We and our posterity have escaped the calamities that a loss of the Constitution would have entailed. Righteous cause, Constitution is preserved. Now let's dig a little bit into this. <clears throat> Following the late Abraham Lincoln's lead, many Northern intellectuals insisted that if the war was not about slavery, nor the preservation of the Union, it was at a minimum a war to preserve the Constitution. No matter what else could have caused the war, that document and the government it created was not at fault. Not just any constitution survived. It was Lincoln's constitution that won, and it was his argument that the constitution must be interpreted through the lens of a particular reading of the Declaration of Independence. That is to say, uh, northern ca righteous causers, like Lincoln, believed the framers created a liberal political order dedicated to individualism, individual natural rights, a pro-business economic environment, and a cultural order in which mild forms of individual improvement could be achieved. In short, the founding was all about creating a country based on individualism and self-improvement without the need for serious and widely appreciated social institutions. All you needed was the Constitution, the federal government, and natural and civil rights. Didn't need much else. Everything would flourish. 
To paraphrase the rhetoric of the antebellum free soul movement that Lincoln endorsed, it was a constitutional order based on free individuals, free will, and a free government lunch. It was not a world defended by most American patriots in the Revolution, especially given their commitment to protecting their homes, their communities, family, property, churches, in a wide variety of social associations against external political control. In other words, they did, would not have understood this liberal order that Lincoln and his followers insisted was being creation. But the constitution of the righteous cause was nonetheless firmly individualistic and perpetuated individualism primarily through a legal environment and courts dedicated to instituting natural rights and equality through civil means. This is a very important thing to understand, folks, what the Constitution was to the righteous causers of the Civil War, as you'll see in just a moment. Integral to the righteous cause Constitution, no mention should be made of any major disagreements or sectional division at the Constitution's formation. The Philadelphia Convention merely upheld the overarching unity of the new American nation. It replaced the sectional and divisive aberration, temporary aberration, of the country's first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, uh, with one that was most fitting to our unity as an individualistic people committed to natural rights. We were united best only because we constitutionally dedicated ourselves to perpetuating individual rights. Southerners were not alone in challenging this perspective in political speeches, periodicals, newspapers, and journals scattered throughout the era. Northerners worked feverishly to save the Constitution, <clears throat> but could not easily disconnect it from the tangled web of antebellum issues. In fact, in an effort to try and end all of those antebellum arguments about the Constitution, they only gave ammunition to the other side. It was a debate which Southerners owned. The last thing Northern righteous causers hoped to do was continue a debate on the meaning, the original meaning of the United States Constitution. Well, there was one way out of this. One way was simplifying the issues into one core litmus test, slavery. So the war was only about slavery. While not really a winning strategy prior to the war, it seemed now to give Northerners everything they wanted, a righteous cause, justification for the slaughter, and heroes worth their weight in granite. While the monocausal explanation kept up the North's own myth of the war, it did not suit everyone. And just to make this clear, the, the, the point here is that, that Northern constitutionalists insisted the war was about slavery because they didn't want the debate and argument to turn to the Constitution. They didn't want Americans to reflect upon the Constitution that Lincoln and others had argued existed before the war. They didn't want that. So let's just talk about slavery. Perpetuating a view of the Constitution that supported a libertarian, individualistic reading of the Constitution met serious opposition from social reformers who were increasingly dissatisfied after the war with their own harsh moralistic tones. You see, the war and slavery argument just didn't fit with the narrative that social reformers were constructing. It's too easy, too clean, too neat, too simplistic. If the war was caused exclusively by slavery and the oppressive regime of the slave power, what about all of our other problems? 
If by painting slavery is not only the root problem of the antebellum America, but also an aberration in our long march of, of liberty, what happened when slavery ended? Why did political corruption, moral degradation, crime, and economic oppression continue? No longer could everything be blamed on the South or the Irish. <laughs> the same could be said about any series of other antebellum problems that they believed were caused by singular things. Alcohol abuse and crime. Why did we still have crime when people drank less? Western settlement and Indians. Why was Western settlement still a problem after we pacified the Indians? Why were we still struggling with issues of time and space, even though we had built transcontinental railroads? By defining American history as a struggle between evil, the South and slavery, versus good, everybody else, Northern intellectuals and historians like George Bancroft, Henry Adams, and James Ford Rhodes unknowingly set the stage for their failure and the success of future progressive intellectuals. You see, key progressive intellectuals, notably Oliver Wendell Holmes, John Dewey, William James, and Charles Pierce, experienced the war in ways typical of many Northerners. To them, it was bad. Rather than glory, they witnessed death, destruction, humiliation, and hypocrisy. The war caused young reformers to equate moral certainty with principles, and principles with death. Oliver Wendell Holmes, perhaps the chief architect of, of modern America's legal order, wrote in a letter to Frederick Pollock, quote, the abolitionist had a stock phrase that a man was either a knave or a fool who did not act as they knew to be right. He went on, when you know that, you know persecution is coming. When young reformers like Holmes matured and held professional positions of influence, they worked hard they worked hard to overturn the Righteous Cause Constitution and the individualistic social order Lincoln claimed it created. Thus, what emerged from the Righteous Cause myth set at odds two equally incorrect views of the Constitution. One was individualism and a liberal order. The other was a progressive order of managerial and scientific control. In the one, certainty was absolute and worth the killing. In the other, that of the progressives, was only probability and aggregates, things which make us wish we were dead. Here lies the most important constitutional repercussion of the American Civil War. On the one hand were Lincolnian constitutionalists who insisted the Constitution and a tradition of individualism were never to blame. On the other hand were young progressives who believed that the Constitution and individualism were precisely to blame. And we worry about Southerners and their lost cause. Rather than seeing progressivism as the importation of German and foreign political thought, it behooves us to understand how progressives rejected the righteous cause narrative, but had little exposure to the real accomplishments of the framers and the founding generation. Progressivism in America began not in distant German universities and among the students of George Frederick Hegel, this is the argument of virtually every mainstream conservative critic of progressivism, that it was a German import. But rather than beginning there, 
It occurred when Oliver Wendell Holmes witnessed his Harvard classmate, Henry Abbott, mortally wounded at the Battle of the Wilderness. Albert Einstein, the Albert Einstein, probably the only time in an Abbeville summer school will ever quote Albert Einstein. <laughs> he later recounted a, a, a conversation with Holmes when Holmes said, quote, after the Civil War, the world never seemed quite right again. Holmes, like so many other future progressive intellectuals, abandoned all faith in old America and all hope for the Constitution at the bloody angle of Spotsylvania. No righteous cause could ever convince them otherwise. I have just a few minutes remaining. The final element of the righteous cause myth involves the insistence that the North's victory over American culture was complete, as it was with anything else. In this sense, the South's greatest retreat, then, involved the slow, steady progress of American identity upon Southerners, the slow dissipation of its accent, the steady dispersion of its people across the country, and the labeling of the South as the country's most backward region. Southerners who thought about the war expressed only vindictiveness and ingratitude. While small southern victories occurred, they were limited, in, according to this view, only to acts of white supremacy. And even the southern memory of the war itself existed only to foster racism. They were all good old rebels. Imagine for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, as we close this, what Southerners culturally accomplished after the war. They largely settled the West, especially the Southwest in Southern California. They continued to show great accomplishments in entrepreneurship and trade. They invented iconic American products, not the least of which are Coca-Cola, Pepsi Cola, and Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Southern writers, black and white, commanded the respect of Northern and international audiences over and above most other regional American writers. Southerners quickly claimed national success in music and film, and Southern locales and family life became the setting of some of our most famous films and television programs. Um, Southerners almost single-handedly created contemporary American musical forms. Much to the chagrin of Northern intellectuals and Civil War veterans, Southerners gradually came once again to dominate American politics, especially in the halls and committee rooms of the United States Congress. Harry Byrd, Carter Glass, John Eastland, Strom Thurmond, Lyndon Johnson, John Stennis, Salm Irvin, and Salm Nunn are just a few of the names of the 20th century's greatest American political leaders, whether you like them or not. Even after some of these lost on the issues of white supremacy and segregation, they still exercised great political influence it makes one wonder just how important white supremacy ever was for these people. In terms of American religion and Christianity, J. Gresham Machen and Billy Graham may be the two most important American religious leaders of the past 150 years. Both were Southerners. And this does not even um, give us time to discuss major conservative religious movements that include the Southern Baptist, who became the largest national denomination in 1968. Christian music, the creation of conservative denominations like the Presbyterian Church in America, and major southern seminaries that grew in affluence at the expense of those in Boston, Philadelphia, and Chicago, even conservative seminaries in those areas. In all of these accomplishments, we must pause to ask very important questions. Did any of this come from a spirit 
of vindictiveness? Did good old rebels perpetuate Southern co uh, cultural institutions to the heights of American identity? Did any of this come from Southerners standing before history and yelling, stop? Success came because Southerners continued to fight the good fight while they busied themselves doing what they always did best, living life to the fullest. Like the mighty Mississippi that serves as the geographic and cultural spine of the South, Southerners stayed within their banks by choice. And despite all the best efforts by Northern victors to control its currents, the mighty South continued to go its own way. In an odd midst, of radio preachers, country music stations, rock and roll performers, television chefs, popular comedians, hard-nosed politicians, soul-winning preachers, internationally famous authors, and successful, successful statesmen. They included men like Jerry Clower and Jerry Falwell, as well as Billy Graham and William Faulkner, the Jerrys and the Billys. Is it possible that the Jerry's and the Billy's did more than any magazine or Washington think tank to sustain cultural conservatism? In all their accomplishments over the 20th century, one theme remained consistent among Southerners. One thing held all Southerners together, even if they were politically opposite or racially different. One thing Southern veterans of the war and those who remembered them held true and continued to resonate for generations. They all held a sense of gratitude. It was not hate nor bitterness that kept the South alive, but an undying sense of appreciation that what their forefathers did and what was inherited would be no source of shame. It was the best they could be done in a fallen world where men and women were called to build a civilization that for a time at least would make our temporal lives worth living. Thank you.